Welcome to the Brains Magazine podcast, a podcast with in-depth interviews and conversations with world-class entrepreneurs, expert coaches, industry leaders, and international celebrities. Get exclusive insight into the world of business, mindset, leadership, and lifestyle with your host, Mark Sefton. I want to welcome you to this next episode of the Brains Magazine podcast. And today we have Steve Wood. Steve is using neuroscience to help organizations realize and unlock their potential. Steve, how are you today? I'm good, Mark. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I must admit, I have to ask, have the Matildas recovered from the Lionesses giving them a good uh, morning? <laughs> uh, we're still fighting back the tears. You just, I mean, look, you've probably seen the, you know, a lot of the media coverage, but uh, yeah, Australia, Australia really got behind them. And I think there was, I heard like 11, 11 million viewers for the semi final. So, I know those figures probably you know don't compare to to the UK's, but it's almost half the population. Yeah, I think you know I know too well as an as an England fan, mainly in the in the men's game though, of of getting to a final or or semis and getting knocked out, like because that's happened all the time with the English uh, men's <laughs> team at least. So I I definitely know the pain. Yeah, well, they look in, to, to be fair. England deserved to win. Yeah, they 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 were great competition. Yeah, that's very gracious, and uh, yeah, it was, it was actually a good game. Um, I was seeing the women's game just improve uh, year on year, which initially I, I never really had much time for it. Um, but actually, the standard is definitely improving. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, anyway, and enough of uh. Uh, me uh, poking insult to injury, right? So um, I'm really excited for today because I love anything to do with the mind. Um, and obviously, I've I've been looking at your work and uh, been really interested in uh, some of your transitions as well that I want to what that I want to talk about. Uh, you obviously spent 25 years uh, in a career around, you know, a high achievement which was accomplished as a as a television. Uh, director, producer, and an executive producer, and I'm find I find it really interesting, actually, Steve, how you've you've had that background, and now you've moved into something um, a little different. But I, I wonder why has it become an ex- obsession of yours? Discovering, for example, why athletes in particular succeed and others don't, and was that kind of really fueled from? your time as a producer by interviewing so many people that made you really curious. And that kind of does really sit with what you do currently. Uh, It it, it does. And I think, look, the whole onset of this was, I think sort of partially drip fed to me as a kid because my, my mum, you know, wasn't way out of left field, but she always had books about, you know, how to improve your mind and, you know, how to overcome certain obstacles that we face in life. But once I was in TV and particularly when I started to climb the ranks and I, you know, got closer to to sports people and, and the presenters and commentators too because in their right, you know, they're, they're high achievers as well. You know, it takes a lot to become a sports commentator to know your facts and to... Um, you know, be committed to the message that you're you're giving out to people. But with sports people, I I, I became fascinated by what really made the elite athletes stand out when in competition. It doesn't matter what sport you you look at. Um, I, I spent a lot of time doing a whole range of sports, but a lot of motorsport, Formula One, MotoGP. Um, did a lot of basketball, a lot of um, swimming and uh, Ironman triathlon competitions. But when you get to that elite lev- level, the the athletes are all pretty well close together as far as capability goes. So, for instance, you take Formula One, um, you know, all the guys that are in Formula One, they know how to drive a motor car and they can run around a track drive around a track, 
you know, within a second or a second and a half of each other. But what is it that sets some apart from the other? And the analysts and the commentators might say, oh, well, you know, so-and-so's got, you know, better ties or, you know, their team's got a, you know, better engineering department or, you know, the, the, some drivers are better in wet weather and dry. It, you, can, you can take all that, but then there's some consistency about the drivers that are at the top and particularly in Formula 1 where you've got teams where two cars are almost identical and someone finishes first all the time and someone finishes sixth or seventh. Mm. Um, and people will have, you know, they will have an argument about, you know, what's really going on here. But there's no doubt in my mind that it's, it's definitely about mindset. Mm. And so it doesn't matter what sport you pick. You, 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 people know Michael Jordan, for instance, you know, Michael Schumacher. Those guys were at the top of their field for a long time and both of them have said it's about what you do with your mind, you know, mm. how you focus, you know, how you get rid of the distractions. Um, and so this is, this is one of the things that fascinated me. Yeah, it's fascinating and I, I totally agree. I, I, I would like to get your thoughts as well. It's not to counteract this because I totally yeah. agree with you that it is about the mind. But even like the other day, you know, like I'm not a professional sportsman, but I do like to play a different array of, of sports. And uh, the other day uh, I was involved in a tennis match um, and I realized that when I when I returned the ball before they returned it, I was already thinking about like what shot I was going to was going to do. And actually, some of the times I didn't execute. And I found that actually when when I tend to have the greatest response uh, when it comes to tennis in particular, it's more around instinct. And actually, the more that I think, then actually the the more problems that it creates. So do, do you see instinct as part of some of the preparation, maybe of what somebody's mindset is before they enter like the court or enter the field or enter the track? Is it what's going on outside of the races and the competition that actually creates that that edge as well? Um, definitely. So I think there's, there's two things here that, that you need to consider. One is the technical aspect. So there's a book written by, I forget the name of the guy, but it's called The Magician's Way. And it's basically what he talks about is, um, he spent a lot of time working with golfers, mm. for instance. And he talks about he used to try and get them out of the swing zone. So golfers, you know, when they're practicing, you know, it's about where their feet is, how, you know, where their hands are, how they, you know, draw the club back, you know, how they hit the ball. Well, once you know how to do that and it's becomes subconscious, just like when we learn to drive a car, we don't know what we're doing. How are we ever going to learn to drive a car, change the gears, put the foot on the clutch, the accelerator, stop, turn, indicate, watch for the pedestrians, you know? It's like it's all too overwhelming. But a, a little while down the track, we hop in the car and we drive. We don't even know how we do it half the time, how we get from point A to point B. So with the, the point, to your point about the sports people, once they've got the skill... It's about getting outside of that and focusing on exactly almost letting their body do the technical stuff and focusing their mind on what it is that they want to achieve. Mm. And are you seeing like specific habits or, or behaviors from these athletes that kind of are real commonplace that indicate high achievement? Is the is the things that all these people over your twenty five year career and the work you've been doing recently that kind of have some real clear similarities? Uh, originally, what I was fascinated by was their journey. So there, and I sort of ended up dividing it into like three groups. Mm -hmm. So there was the ones that sort of just had this natural confidence and did well there were the other ones that had to work 
hard at it to get to the top of their sport. And then there, there was this other group that struggled but managed to find somebody that was able to unlock the door for them. And once that happened, they took off. Mm. Um, so uh, I, I had a friend who is a, a, an Ironman. He, he'd won like seven world championships. Oh. And he told me one day that he nearly gave up because when he was a junior, he got bullied. He didn't think he was any good. He always came last. In fact, it, that is really common. The number of athletes that I, I've spoken to, that when they started, they just never, ever thought they were going to make it because they are always coming last. You know, they didn't think they had it in them. And then something happens where it all clicks and away they go. And in the, the case of this Iron Man, he got to the point where he was so focused, he said things would happen that he just couldn't understand. And I don't want to get into the like the weird area, but he said, you know, like a, a wave would just come and pick him up and he, he would he would be, you know, 100 metres ahead of everybody else. Mm. He'd have to, it'd have to slow down because he didn't want to beat them by that much. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't uh, it, how you have to go through like almost uh, rock bottom or have the contrast of, you know, finishing last. It reminds me of the film Seabiscuit who had a, a great pedigree um, who was en- ended up being sold for the rock bottom price to give confidence to the other horses. So they basically made him like lose so that other horses could build up their confidence and he forgot how to be a horse and really fascinating yeah. film. Are you familiar yeah. with that film? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it's similar to that, isn't it? It's kind of redefining who you really are. He'd forgotten what it was to be a horse and sometimes yeah. I think we forget what it's actually like to to be somebody who's achieving something. And often we need to have the contrast of setback in order to see the comeback. Yeah, yeah. And I, and so, look, I think the, just sort of moving on is that what I found was that, that, okay, so we focus on Formula One. They can all drive a motor car. But, but... What is it that never ever enables them to stand on a podium? And so then I started to crunch this down to this image. There's been plenty written about it, but self image, self concept, what we believe about ourselves. And those messages um, are instilled in us at a very, very early age. So, for instance, I've had sports people that um, they've been so close to, you know, winning or finishing and then something happens, you know, they have an accident or, you know, someone cuts them off or and you talk to them afterwards, oh, yeah, what happened there? Mm. But when you start digging down, what comes up is things like, mm, uh, uh, if I win, uh, what happens if, I'm standing on the podium and I say the wrong thing. What happens if I'm in the press conference and I don't know what to say? What happens if I'm not acknowledged by family and friends? Um, and and it's not conscious because all these things are below the level of consciousness, but they play out when you, you're trying to achieve something. Mm. So it seems like your curiosity has definitely been the catalyst, I think, in terms of of what you're what you're doing now. So, Steve, how how are you really using neuroscience to help organisations and individuals? So, moving on from the sports people, what I discovered was that there was plenty written about the self image and the self concept, and they were dealing with what happens in individuals. But my thought was okay, what happens when you go to an organisation that's got 50, 100, however many employees, and every one of them has got this concept about themselves? One of the common ones is, am I good enough? What happens if I fail? What happens if my idea is not acknowledged? Um, And these things 
play once again subconsciously through their mind. And what I was getting back from organisations was we don't know what's going on here, but we're employing highly qualified people. We're employing people that have got lots of experience, but we just don't seem to be able to um, improve our productivity or become more creative. And once again, once you start digging down, you see that there's you've got 100 people all with a different frame around what they believe themselves to be, um, you know, with what, what their position is in the company. Not everybody wants to be a leader or a, a, a manager, but quite often people are, you know, pushed in that direction. Um, you know, what happens in, in, in a meeting if I don't speak up or I don't put my idea forward or... Uh, so there's a whole range of things, but basically people are playing out this concept of themselves. So um, my job is to go and sort of untangle that so that they get an understanding of, it, of what's going on. Yeah, so because earlier you mentioned that three things that were really prominent with people that ha had achieved was natural confidence, a uh, work ethic, and then having someone to help them unlock, uh, yeah. and I guess that's the role that you're playing. Is that is that kind of one of the reasons as well why you're doing what you're doing? Because you realise that sometimes there is just an opportunity there where you see the potential, and and you're saying that most people's capabilities are matched, but it's the bit under the hood, if you like, that that needs kind of tinkering. A lot of people are are struggling with self-sabotage, aren't they? Yeah, well, um, you know, my, my daughter said to me the other day, she said, you know, I went to this conference, it was a women's conference, and the speaker said, hands up anybody who thinks that they have imposter syndrome. And she said, I was amazed. Nearly everybody in the room stuck their hand up, you know. And so um, uh, it's not like there, there are obviously some people that, you know, have got, some natural confidence and you know we'll push through anything mm. the big i think look i think the big thing there's several things but one thing is that and this came out during COVID, is that 95 percent of our day is spent in autopilot and we're only five percent of the day thinking consciously about new ideas and quite often people say to me, you know, look, I don't understand that. I don't know where you got your research from, but you need to explain it to me. So I just get like from the beginning of the day, just tell me what happens. I get out of bed. I have a shower. I get dressed. I have my breakfast. I hop in the car or the train or the bus. I come to work. I know the people that I'm working with. I know the ones I can trust. I know the ones I can challenge. I know the ones that are going to try and derail me. I know where I'm going to have lunch and then it sort of plays out in the afternoon and then you come home and you know, you know, where you live, you, you, uh, you know, what you're going to have for dinner. Um, so there's this cycle that we get very used to. And I think uh, we probably don't want to wind the clock back too much to, to COVID, but I think this was one of the big things during COVID was that people were very comfortable in this, this automatic zone. And then all of a sudden it got broken open mm -hmm. not only you know they're working from home but they had to learn new technologies they had to work out how to communicate differently and and you know work differently um and of course uh, uh, there's no research for this but remember it look it took 12 plus months before there was a, a vaccine but once there was a vaccine there was more structure around uh, people were being told what to do again Mm. And we could get into that. Not everybody was, was comfortable with it, but I think you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, and and automatic, autopilot is not bad all the time. You just need to be conscious of what part of your life is autopilot. Like you, you don't want to go to work every day and learn how to turn your computer on, or you don't want to. You, mm. you, there's some good things about you know, remembering things and doing things on autopilot. It's just making sure that you're aware of things that 
you might be bypassing you that you yeah. really need to be paying attention to. Yeah, it's so important. I think that we live consciously and with intent. You know, I typically, if I do something, I'm doing it with with intent. It's because I want to do it. My heart's in it. I'm focused on it. I don't. I'm not sleepwalking through life, which I think yeah. that's the danger, isn't it? Of autopilot is the fact that we do things for the sake of doing them, but we're not yeah. doing them with any sense of fulfillment or pride or or high energy because I always like look to the fruit of the things that I do. And if it isn't producing fruit, then I kind of want to move away from that. Is that really kind of what the challenge is here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think people, people tell themselves a story about their capability and they think that that is it. And you, and, and people verbalize this, you know, I don't think I could ever do that or, you know, I'm, I'm no good at writing, I'm no good at maths, you know, I, I'm, I'm not athletic, or I could never go to the gym, um, <laughs> whatever. Or well, none of that is true because you can do anything. Mm. And, and the, the driving example is a great um, uh, e- example of that yeah. where you don't think you'd ever master it, but you can. Mm. And one of the things I do is just if, if you just do something for a week, You'll be amazed how how you you know improve. You want to learn the guitar. You can make big progress in a week if mm. you practice even for half an hour. Exactly, exactly. And the 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 neuroscience around that is how the brain makes new connections and starts remembering and um, you know building a neuro circuitry in your brain. Mm. So for all for all this journeying and, and your own reflection, Steve, like talk to me about your Thrive formula and, and why you created such uh, an extensive twelve week course around self image. Like, what what is that really about, and, and why have you brought it to market? So, one of the other things that I discovered is I'm not sure what it's like in the UK around the rest of the world, but a lot of organisations have a budget for training mm. and I need to be careful what I say here, but for instance, if you're an architect or, you know, you're an account and you're, you know, have to learn some new software and they get somebody in to teach you or you do an online program and then you go back to your desk and you're, you're using that software. There is some absolute value in that. If someone comes in and wants to, teach you about leadership or management or diversity or whatever it is. And they're there for a day or two days and then they leave. And then you go back to your desk with the fancy handbook. You got to say, how much of that am I going to really put into action or I'm going to remember. Mm. And one of the, one of the ways that we remember is through repetition. Mm -hmm. Just like the way we learnt the ABC, or you know, learnt to do anything, it was just repetition. So my idea is that we go in for twelve weeks, and there's a repetition about the message. It's dropped in stages, but it's reinforced and reinforced and reinforced, so that by the end of the twelve weeks, you can really see to see some change. It's hard to measure, but it's easy to see, you know, the difference in the people and they'll they'll just go, oh, my God, you know, it's just like I, I never thought I was capable of this or I can't believe what I've learned or I can't believe how I've changed or um, e- even if it's the way they're, in, uh, you know, their perspective on things and how they're interacting with other staff members. Mm. I know that when we think of like self-image, Steve, we often think about how we dress, don't we? But it isn't just about that. But do you actually touch on that? Because I always find it really interesting. Like even before a podcast, I might wear a shirt. <laughs> I'll put on I'll put on cologne, even though you can't smell me. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, gee, you smell really nice. Don't you? <laughs> um, sure, but um, but. That 
you know, what happens when the cologne wears off or, you know, the next day you, you know, just hop in your daggy clothes? No doubt that it, you know, it, it, it makes a difference. But I think the big thing is how we, how are you going to make long-term mm. difference? And, you know, the things that I do, you know, I talk about the, 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 the you know, first of all, how we're programmed from an early age, explain how we record memory with the conscious and subconscious mind, how that plays out into, you know, the results that we're getting in our life is around this self-image, what we're telling ourselves all the time. Mm. It, it, it's easy to measure because you just see what you what results you're getting. Um, and then things like, you know, the trying to break the terror barrier, you know, things that, you know, when someone comes and says, oh, you know, it's time for you to move up the ladder or, you know, what would you think about earning another $50,000 or pound a year? Um, and people get, oh, could that really be me? You know, they, they could I really do that? Um, because you haven't got a map in your mind about what that looks like. And so part of this is trying to create the map of what happens if you could actually achieve your goals mm. beyond where you are now. What would you say is your personal like nemesis when it comes to your own personal challenge uh, around, <laughs> you know, maybe your own self-talk uh, and how do you overcome it, Steve? Because obviously even professionals like yourself, um, you know, obviously struggle. I think sometimes it's really helpful to have that human connection uh, with people that we're trying to lead to say, you know, I, I struggle too, but this is what I do to, to overcome. Oh, I've, I've, <laughs> I've been on my, definitely been on my own journey. And, you know, part of the wake up call for me was being in TV. You know, I was in awe of, you know, a lot of people. And until I got closer to them, I started to hear their stories. I began to believe that, you know, anything is is possible. But I think the big, you know, it, there's plenty of tips around, but one of the, the, the things is just being conscious of what you're saying to yourself all the time and stop it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, 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 you know, what is it that you really want to achieve? What is it that you really want to do? Yeah, I think, I think. And start telling that story. Yeah. And I think sometimes we, we take, we, we actually hurt ourselves by the story we, we tell ourselves when it's based on somebody else's behavior and not actually our own. The amount of times in the past where, I've kind of said, oh, Mark, maybe you're not that lovable or maybe you are forgettable because somebody hasn't chosen to uh, take the time to to check in on me, for example. And then you would self-harm yourself thinking you're the problem, but whereas actually it's their inability to be able to manage their time and be able to communicate, you know, and sometimes yeah. we need to stop hurting ourselves, don't we? Oh, ab ab absolutely. And... Uh, look, this happened years ago, but uh, I did a course and one of the things that you had to do was you had to go to the local shopping centre and you had to just smile. At, like one of my problems was early on uh, was, you know, I'd walk down the street and I'd have my head facing the footpath and, you know, I wouldn't look at anyone. But this thing of looking people in the eye you don't have to communicate with them but you know mm. just raise your hi how are you going you can change somebody's day change their chemistry just by acknowledge them you don't know you know need an introduction don't know who they are and i just i don't want to say i have fun with it. i don't treat it like a game but i do it automatically now and i still get amazed by the reactions I get, you know, I'm like, oh, oh. So the people get surprised that someone's noticing them or, you know, taking the time to, to, to say hello. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it, that? And sometimes 
I remember like we talked about COVID a lot. I remember like walking through my park when everything was locked down and this little boy, he must have only been about eight months old. He he caught my eye. He gave me a, such a lovely smile. And it just like when when we're in a world where you couldn't even hug people that you cared about, <laughs> just to have that innocence was like so like healing. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, it, it, the other point with that is that when you do it, not only do you change their chemistry, but you change your own chemistry. Right. And chemistry is such an important thing that um, you, you, if you're on the negative side of the ledger, you're using a lot of your energy you're wasting a lot of your energy in stress and doubt and fear and anxiety. Whereas if you just do little simple things, it doesn't take much to say hi to someone. And particularly if you do it in a shop, mm. you know, you go to your local cafe or whatever, and you do it on a regular basis, you, 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 you know, learn everybody's name. Mm. You become like a magnet. People just love seeing you walk in their shop. And it can change your life. Very true. It's very true. Steve, how do people find out more about you and and your business and what you're up to? And if if there's anything that's really burning that you that you feel like you want to say, and now's your chance uh, to do it. Well, they can. Uh, it's uh, Leaders in Mind, so you can just go to www.theleadersinmind.com or .com au. And uh, you can send me an email, steve, at leadersinmind.com.au or .com. And I'll give you all the information that you need. Love that, Steve. Well, thank you for joining me on today's uh, Brains podcast. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for joining this episode with me, Mark Sefton. I hope you've really enjoyed it. Feel free to leave us a positive review on iTunes. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the next episode of the Brains Magazine podcast.